here we're going to get set up, but uh, of course we're doing active learning. Um, and so we thought it would be best that we created a presentation that incorporated active learning. <laughs> so I'm going to ask all you guys to, if y'all can, pair up in groups of two. And if y'all can, if you've got your phone, we're going to try a new game called Kahoot. How many of y'all have played Kahoot before? Mm -hmm. All right, I would definitely pair it with somebody that's played Kahoot then. Because <laughs> they may actually have the app. But you can actually download this app on Google Play Store or on your iPhone apps. And it works very well with that. Um, we're getting it set up on here. Um, once we get set up, it'll actually be a password that you have to put in. Um, so if y'all want to pair up into some groups, our whole presentation is going to be a game. Cool. It's kind of like who's fine as anyway. Every question is worth points, but at the end, the points don't matter. Right? It's the one with the big purple K. Yep. Big purple K with the exclamation mark. That's what the app looks like. So if you get on there. Um, just kahootit.com. You'll find it on there if you want to go on the internet version, if you want to download the app, which I would Highly recommend you guys would have it and be able to play around with it. All right. When you go onto it, it'll look like this if you go on the internet version. All right. And if you go in there, it's going to ask you for our game pin. So if you would please put that game pin in there. Then it's going to ask you to give you a team name. You're going to have to put a team name in.
that you. the bottom line, I think it was one of the articles that I was reading, that if you're in a lecture, your attention usually starts to wane in about 10, 15, 20 minutes. So imagine your students are in class. We have a lot of students, at least some of my students, I don't know if this is a true diagnosis for them, but they're hyperactive and all these different things. They just cannot sit there for a long period of time and not do anything. This is what sold me, the idea that we learn and remember 80 to 90% of what we do by being engaged in active learning. So that if nothing else, that's the selling point. And as instructors, we want our students to learn. I mean, that's the bottom, that's why we're here. So if we can find some, um, some techniques that we can use and that they're active learning, our students are going to get it. Okay? Number three. Next question. I think me is cheating. <laughs> he had an inside. Oh, how do you write all of them here, though? You touch them all? You can touch just any of them. Just pick any of them. Okay. All right. Where do you want it? Okay. No, you do touch it in his correct. It is so many activities that you can do that start very, very basic and go all the way up to more difficult. And I think it's been that's going to tell you a little bit about looking at resources and stuff. But the ones that we put here, at least the ones that I put here, are really easy. The minute paper, that's basically, you could do this at the end of class. Um, you know, what did they learn? I mean, I had, a, I had a class last semester, and my students, I forget what we were talking about, and again, this is in sociology, and they just had that look that was just glazed over. And I had asked, you know, was there anything that you want to, you know, questions or anything you want to share, and they just sat there. So I thought about the minute paper and I said, okay, you know, take this out, just write something down. And then they got to leave and then afterwards when I went into my office, they had all these profound statements and they, they really did get everything I was talking about. But for whatever reason, they didn't want to share that with the class. So that was confirmation that, you know, they were getting the information and however I was feeling about it, it didn't matter. They got the information and it was just like a check. Okay, so now we can go on to the next thing uh, that we need to go with. The think, pair, and share, I think it's basically a minute paper, but you're doing it with somebody else because you're giving them time to think about what it is. Then they get to talk to their partner about what it is that they're doing and then they share it. So it's just, I think, you know, it's just a just a, another way of looking at that. They, they're doing it with someone else. They're not necessarily having to write it down. Self-assessments are good, and I never even thought about this, but maybe at the beginning of a chapter, you can have a quiz. You can do cahoots to, to give them an idea. You want to know what it is that they know or they don't know. So it's a, a pretest that you can use that's not graded but it'll give you a place to, to realize that, you know what, I don't have to spend so much time on this concept because they already know it. So this is what I need to spend most of my time doing. So it's just to assess where they are. And then case studies. I know everybody's been through the QEP um, seminars or, or, or um, activities here on campus. And one thing that I remember that Andy and Matthew shared is that when you're talking about ethical dilemmas, use an ethical dilemma that is real and that you actually have an answer or, or either you can, you can find out exactly what happened. So with the case studies, you know, if you could you know, give them real life situations that they can apply what they learned in the classroom and apply it to real life situations, they're, you know, they're able to connect it and to you know, understand what it is that you're actually doing. Any questions? Do you think it is the students to write their own case studies? You know, because students have a lot to share, and they've been through a lot. And um, rather than We're all saying the, same the instructor thing. always says, why don't you give information? Why don't we let students give us the information? I mean, that's just the way I feel about it. And that's real, <laughs> you yeah. know? And then probably the other students in the classroom will have something similar that they can add to. I think that's great. If I may add one thing, on the self-assessment, a lot of times students don't know what they don't know. So when they do a self-assessment, they get an idea of, I have, I, I use one called a three, two, one, kind of like, you know, a countdown. Give me three things that you actually know that you know, 
two things you kind of sort of know, but a little iffy about, and one I absolutely have no clue about. And I tell them the last thing can't be, the answer can't be everything. <laughs> and the first thing can't be nothing. You know? So I put some, you know, some parameters around it, and it makes them think about what it is that they're trying to learn. I do that sometimes as I'm approaching an exam or whatever. It gives me some idea how much, how in-depth the review needs to be or whatever. Um, Oh, he's on fire. Oh, he's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Just me. Is that what it is, man? <laughs> so once again, they're all correct. Uh, when integrating, uh, <laughs> when thinking about learning and teaching, you should always integrate questions and opportunities. And what that does, it gives the chance for students to participate and gives them a chance to conversate with the teacher. And it kind of takes away that intimidation factor as well, that the teacher is open to conversation versus just you know, a one-way uh, sense of talking to the students and not being able to talk back or give uh, feedback. Uh, create collaborative learning opportunities. Uh, what that does too is uh, allow students to learn together and learn from each other. A lot of times, um, you know, maybe one student maybe not, maybe would not want to talk. Maybe they're kind of shy. Maybe they don't want to let people know anything about it themselves. But being able to talk with somebody one-on-one -on -one opens a door for them to share with each other about information, um, maybe make friendships or anything like that. And that third one allows students to take an active role in class activities uh, once again, it encourages student participation, and it also encourages them to take ownership of what they're learning and what they, uh, how they want to grasp their own um, education. So uh, that's what those three do, and that's why they're all right. So the trick is, they're all right to one wrong. Oh, no, my question is, oh, there's no. only one right answer. We're sick. We're sick. like that it just they, they grasp it more I actually teach automotive here so we do a lot of group work and so um, the other thing that it brings out is it develops that social employment situations um, you know a lot of the business a lot of the stuff when we go out into the field a lot of people are going to be working in groups so you got to learn how to work with people so doing this collaborative group work especially for us in automotive you know you get that ability for them to work with somebody and, and, and you know work in cohesion with them all right, and then deeper learning of the content. When you get them to work in groups and you get them to do group work, you know, maybe a student might be able to, you know, kind of assist the other student and make them see something. You, uh, all of a sudden you start getting that where students teaching student type thing. And then and that's, that's really like what I like to see when I'm teaching automotive classes is when you get that student that's like, oh yeah, here, look, let me show you. And then they just, you know, showed what I had showed them and they're, you know, learning together and everything like that. And sometimes you'll find that students learning from other students, they tend to grasp it a lot better too. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Sometimes the total yeah, becomes they, more than the sum of the parts there because the, yeah. the teachers learning, you know, they're both yeah. pulling it. Actually. Yeah, it's exactly. Really cool. Yeah. The develop yeah. social and employment situations that threw me off, and of course my answer is wrong when I told Kelly. Mm -hmm. I probably, <laughs> I probably <laughs> would change the wording to allows for social and employment relationships, okay. rather than developing social and employment, that really goes me off. 
I mean, fill the ones. Yeah. Everybody else probably got it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can still. Yeah, we looked at all the above and went in. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, just about getting it right. right. That's like, the explanation right. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, that's a, you know, for me, and when I looked at it, I was looking at it in our, and that's when we deal with customers and get that people. So, yeah, but no, I, I, I see the relationship part too. So. If I may, again, this is a learned behavior because students come. We're all creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. They're they're accustomed to being passive in the classroom, and it can easily go into. You won't teach me. You're making me learn from my classmates. Oh, you know that? It can very. <laughs> Sweetheart, I teach math. When I put them in groups, you need to show me how to do it. Shut up and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say that. I don't say that. Out loud. <laughs> I have them too. You're thinking. <laughs> you know, this is how I think of my medication. <laughs> They don't, they think that we're supposed to tell them Everything. every single thing yeah. and that you're at, you're not doing your job if you don't. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm here to facilitate your learning, mm -hmm. not to do surgery and open up your head and pour it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a felony. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. Well, yeah, and, and that brings up critical thinking. Yeah. There's uh, the idea of just that, that first level of higher questioning, yes. but then there's that yeah. analytical part, yeah. that yeah. evaluating and they part. Have that, to is, that is in college. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't want to do that next yeah. Sometimes. All right, you ready for the next one? Yes. 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 I throw out an assessment for the students and I make them fill out the entire assessment and do everything. And, and most of it's just parts identification. I want to know which ones of my students know the most about what we have out there. And so, and you can implement this in different ways, but this is how I do it. I lay out all these parts and I have them go through it. And this is literally the, probably the second day that they're in class. And they go through and they go through and label all these parts and they go through. And then I go and grade it. It's not really for a grade, but what I want to do is I want to know which one of my students score the highest on it. And then when I start getting my groups together, I take my highest scoring student and my lowest scoring student and I put them together. And I start, and I usually do about four groups. And so within those four groups, you'll have somebody that scored really high on the preliminary and somebody that scored really low. But what winds up happening, especially when you have a very big group, um, you find out that those higher scoring students tend to help you out a lot more because they understand the material a lot more and then you start getting that student-student teaching going on there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really love to see is when you start getting them working together and everything like that and it really helps out. And so in that way the strength of the, the group, you know, it's, it's even across the board. You don't have one group that has a lot of people that really don't know the material. You have that one or two person in that group that kind of understands the material and they help out the rest of the group. And so it's something that we do. I mean, now I know Kelly had talked about doing the lottery, and there's other ways to do it. It's just that's one of the things that I use in ours, you know, is doing the preliminary assessment. And it really helps with organizing or creating those groups that work. So Much more strategic. Exactly. So. Which one? This one? Okay, so we said the best way to evaluate students' group work is five four individual peer review assessments. And the reason that is, is because it prevents the whole free ridership. If you know some students, as she said earlier, are sponging off of others and taking their grade when in reality they didn't do anything at all. So uh, having the group peer review each other within a group allows uh, a more accurate identification of who did what and 
the individual peer review further edu further encourages their uh, uh, their participation and as the grade as a whole. So. Yeah, they will sell each other out in a heartbeat. Yeah, they will. <laughs> 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 they never came to one meeting, they didn't help you. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually yeah. one student's really nice to everybody. Yeah. Oh, they did great, they did great. But then like, the other's just like, oh, oh yes, they didn't do anything. <laughs> 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 we'd, been, we'd still be waiting. We'd still be waiting. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. students to do individual work before entering the group. Once again, that prevents a free ridership portion of it. Uh, it allows students to take uh, ownership of their own work and then contribute it to the group afterwards. Uh, promote group cohesiveness. Uh, and that ensures cooperation and, individual, and uh, prevents individuality between the students so that uh, students can share amongst each other and talk with each other and align activities and learning goals. And what that does is ensures uh, students are actually learning and trying to get to their goal versus uh, putting something together and they have no idea where the, where the end point is. Uh, ensure both individual and group accountability. Once again, that goes back to uh, participating within a group and the peer review process amongst each other so that way everyone gets a grade for what everybody does. learning is when you actually it's similar to role playing you actually have the students have to be in the moment if you will in the if you're teaching a concept um, I was trying not to use a mathematics uh, example but I'm limited so I'm going to do that <laughs> when I'm trying to get them to understand the concept of solving an equation for example whatever I do to one side I have to do to the other I have to keep it symmetrical if you will right so if I'm if I have students over there and over here and I remove something from that group, what do I have to do over here to keep that concept going? And I don't say it, I get, them, I get it to come from them. That's them experiencing it so that they can't go home and say, well, I've never done this before. You actually did it, now sit down and do it you know, that way. That's one thing to do. Or creating a word problem, like um, everybody in here drives, probably except me. Um, and 
we um, on the on the interstate we know the speed limit but we also know how fast we can go over the speed limit without getting a ticket process that for about 30 15 seconds you know the speed limit and you know how fast you can go without getting a ticket certain times of the day or whatever and I want you to sit down and write an inequality for me that's a compound inequality if X is your speed that's experiential something I've experienced that I can apply to my learning, so to speak, of the concept that I'm doing. Probably more so in his field or in, yeah. in the nursing field. I can get more practical applications of it, but you know, limited on the spot. That's what I can come up with in my theory. Um, jigsaw discussions are good if your content area is heavy in the reading. And you know students hate to read this. Oh yeah, I read the chapter, haven't read the, don't even know the title. <laughs> they didn't even buy the book. Don't even, you mean there is a book? Okay, no, no. But you, know, you can break it up and assign pieces of the reading to individuals or to groups or what have you, and they become the expert on those pieces. I've seen jigsaw discussions done in the form of talking heads or whatever kinds of things. They're different names for the same kind of concept. But getting them more involved in the um, in the learning of, in the content from that perspective. I know in my sociology class, and I took this for graduate school. I have the students at the beginning of the semester decide on a chapter. They have to they have to select a group, and then they decide on the chapter uh, that that group is going to present to the class. So before I speak, they introduce the chapter, and each person in the group, all they have to do is just. Um, present one concept, not the whole chapter, mm -hmm. but I tell them, read the chapter, what is one thing that you want all your classmates to know about, it? and you're the expert on it. So they go up in front of the class, and then they have to show, well, how does that concept uh, impact the individual, how does it impact society? And then they write a test question, that two, four questions, test questions that may appear on the next exam with that chapter on it. So they become the expert. So a little bit to add on to the experimental learning. So we get to use this a lot, and this is probably why I put on there, is because in automotive, when we do, if I like have the students out there and we have a running motor or something like that, they can experiment with how like disabling something, how it affects the motor and the drivability of it. You know, we'll have a running car there, and they get to kind of experiment, like what happens if I lose a spark plug or if I lose, you know, injector, and so they see the characteristics of you know what happens when those systems go down. And so it lets the group, as a group, they get to kind of experiment with that. And I'll let them as a group go on there. And we'll even, and then eventually, when they do their assessment or something like that, I'll induce one of those faults into the car. And they'll actually experience what, you know, they were playing around with earlier. They'll see it on the car, and it'll help them click, like, oh, I know exactly what this is. It's a bad spark plug, you know, and they figure it out. So just to add to that. your time, your space, your overall ability to actually do it. 
there's some things that I would do in my act of learning, you know, stuff I would do that Kelly probably would not be able to do. Um, and so you've got to take that, you got to take into, you know, your lab space, your technology, um, community partnerships, stuff like that. Those are all things that we can utilize for active learning, um, whether we do a lab or whether we do like a community work or technology. Um, but it's one of those things that you also got to make sure that you're going to be able to incorporate this into your class. So it's something that you do need to consider when doing it because you got to make sure you have the space and everything like that. Because if you try to, sometimes it can have a negative effect of it because you're trying to add it in there or do something and it just doesn't really work out, it doesn't flow right, and you kind of lose the ability for the students to be active in it, you know. So it's just something to consider in, in when you're going into active learning and, and trying different things in there. So don't want to add anything to that. Real quick, and active learning is not entertaining the students either. I mean, all of this is not about entertaining the students. They could be, I mean, it could be fun. Y'all are getting into this and want to win the prizes that are on the table already because we didn't bring any. But <laughs> want to bring all the cookies? Yeah, yeah, that's that's you better get the candy milk. <laughs> just to keep in mind, we just want to engage them. We don't want to entertain them until the point that we're just tired <laughs> trying to do all these things and. And like Ben said, some of it doesn't work. It just doesn't work depending on your class. That's all I'm going to add. When I used to work with teachers, uh, math teachers in Durham, North Carolina, I would always tell them every class period, do a self-assessment. How was my student engagement from zero to they were practically in a coma to <laughs> 10? They had it, we had it going on. They were not hanging on my every word, but they were engaged. And if you're somewhere in the five, six or below, Change it for second period, so that you're doing a, you're you're improving. If, you know, during the day, don't wait till the next day of the next unit. Fix it as you're going along, because I know sometimes my first effort out, mm -hmm. I'm getting my bearings. Mm -hmm. So I got to make sure not to make the same mistakes I made next hour that I made in the previous one. That kind of thing. So. Uh, Thank last question.